Tonight, May 31st, and tomorrow, June 1st, the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra welcomes back to Winnipeg the marvelous Canadian horn player James Somerville. Currently serving as the principal horn with the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Somerville has established himself as one of the preeminent horn players, horn players in the world. The concert tonight and tomorrow with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra will feature James Somerville performing not one, but two horn concertos. He'll be performing Mozart's third horn concerto, as well as a brand new concerto written for him by Canadian composer Kati Agosh. And joining me here over Zoom, I am joined by the one and only James Somerville. Hi, James. Nice to see you. Nice hey, to Chris, you. good to see you too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, welcome back to Winnipeg. We were talking about this off the air. It's rainy and wet. Uh, how many times have you performed with the MCO and what keeps you coming back to Winnipeg to perform with them? Um, you know, I was just asking myself that precise question today because uh, I know that it's somewhere between four and six, I guess, let's say. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> the first time I, I played with the group, it was probably in 1996 or seven. Um, what was the year of the flood? Like when things were really bad? 97. Yes. Yeah. So I was here doing a recording um, with the MCO back when Simon Stratfield was the music director. Um, and I've been back a number of times since then under various auspices. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so tonight uh, you're playing two horn concertos and you're also playing uh, conducting music of Respighi and uh, Brahms. Uh, I want to start with the Mozart third horn concerto. He wrote it for an instrument without any rotary valves. It was an all natural horn. Uh, can you talk about some of the hurdles and some of the challenges that uh, Mozart put in uh, the solo horn part, horn part? And is it any easier on valve horn? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll back up a bit and tell you that um, Mozart was a composer who always wrote for specific people or sometimes for commissions, if someone paid him to write a set of string quartets or something, let's say, often for himself to play as well. Um, so all of his horn concertos, and there are four plus bits and pieces of others, um, were written for a family friend named Ignaz Leutke, who's quite a bit older than Mozart and was the butt of a lot of Mozart's jokes. And towards the uh, end of his career, Leutke's career, he had sort of semi-retired from playing the horn. He'd opened up a cheese shop in Vienna. <laughs> and, um, and Mozart, you know, as much as he teased him, he always had great respect for him as a musician and as a player. So it seems this third concerto, which is uh, in fact a later one, um, he kind of talked him out of retirement and um, he kind of adjusted the piece so that the earlier concertos are much more kind of florid and high and virtuosic uh, where this one sits more in the more kind of melodic middle register of the horn. So if you're spending your days selling cheese, you don't have to practice as much. Um, <laughs> um, but, but it's also very, it's very kind of chromatic. So it's got a little bit more uh, harmonic experimentation, those kinds of difficulties than the earlier ones. So, um, so, you know, getting back to your question about the natural horn, on, on the horn of Mozart's day, it, it would have been very challenging because, you know, when you start playing in these foreign keys, it, it makes, needs a lot of manipulation. Um, on the valve horn, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, you can play in any key, it all sounds pretty much the same. So, uh, so, so I would say essentially it's easier on the modern instrument. So uh, by modifications, you're talking about like the cupping of the hand inside the bell to get the chromatic uh, notes. Is, is, that, is that it? Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, to give an analogy, people might know. Uh, well, I don't know if anyone, any of your listeners might have ever blown on a conch shell. You know how, how people do that. And you <laughs> yeah. stick your hand in the end of the conch shell and it, the, the, the note goes down, the pitch goes down. Right. Um, so you know, that's, that's a kind of very simple analogy, but horn players a little bit before Mozart's time figured out that they could do this. And that opened up the repertoire for the instrument a lot, because before that you could kind of play, you know, bugle calls and hunting calls and 
very mm. basic, basic melodies. But once they figured out how to make it a chromatic instrument, then um, the sky was kind of the limit. You mm. can play any have music you ever, on it. Have you ever played it on natural horn? I have, yes. Um, I've played three of the Mozart concertos on the natural horn. Um, so, but fortunately, I think for everybody, they asked me to play it on the modern one because it takes, you know, it's like, um, it's a very different discipline. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of the same skills, but you, you really have to, you can't just kind of pick it up and dust it off and it'll sound fine. You have to put a lot of really months of practice in even just to get skills you already had back up. So, right, right, right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the uh, Kati Agash uh, Horn Concerto and just talk a little bit about the commissioning process and what is this concerto like? Um, well, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, so, it, I mean, it does form an interesting connection with the third Mozart concerto because um, one thing that's unusual about the Mozart is that it has strings, like the normal string section for, for a classical orchestra. And then there are pairs of bassoons and clarinets. And um, mm. that's very unusual for classical scoring. Um, and it may seem, you know, if, if people are not really familiar with symphonic and concerto writing from that time, it might seem just like a, a slightly different color, but it's, it really makes a very different color in the accompaniment. So, you know, um, it's kind of like if you hear a singer sing a song and they're accompanying themselves on an electric guitar, and then you hear the same thing on like a nylon string classical guitar, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's accompaniment, but it's a much kind of woody or darker sound. Um, so she kind of took that as a jumping off point um, in how her piece was arranged, orchestrated. Um, and it makes it a little easier to program too, because then you just have all the same players. Um, but she kind of, she took those instruments in a, in a very creative, interesting way, expanded what they were able to do beyond what Mozart thought of. So, so they play, you know, one of the clarinetists plays a bass clarinet and one of the bassoonists plays contra bassoon. Right. And those are both much lower kind of different sounding instruments. Um, and then in terms of what she asks the rest of the orchestra to do, uh, there's a lot more um, sort of, especially like very delicate writing, you know, very independent writing so that all of the string players in the group might be playing slightly different parts and they'll be playing very transparent music way up high. So it has this really cool kind of airy sound to it. Um, mm -hmm. But also one thing that I really love about the piece is it just has beautiful tunes, you know? Yes. I mean, I know, I know people worry about brand new music because they wonder if there's something that they can actually, you know, find themselves humming as they, leave the door and I and I've played a lot of new pieces and this one really after I'd started practicing it for a while you know I'd find myself whatever like doing laundry and kind of humming the tunes to myself so that's always a good sign yeah yeah when I was prepping for the interview I uh took I was listening to the violin concert it's like a violin concerto with percussion I was thinking the exact same thing the violin part is beautiful like it's 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 very melodic and yeah very very tuneful yeah that's for sure. Yeah. Um, can you talk about like the commissioning? Like now I've got here, it was commissioned by Symphony Nova Scotia, the Sioux City Symphony, the MCO Kalamazoo and Prince Edward Island. So how did that commissioning process work? Um, so in this case, it was, it started with conversations between Katya and I. Um, we, uh, we've known each other quite a long time. I, I've commissioned works from her um, in other situations. So I was music director of the Hamilton Philharmonic in uh, Ontario, and we commissioned a, a really successful short orchestral work from her then. Um, and then a, as a playing member of the Boston Symphony, um, that group commissioned a small chamber work from her mm. um, a few years ago. So, you know, we, and we're in touch. We, we both teach at the New England Conservatory. So we, you know, we cross paths and, um, and she, she, I, I'm pretty sure she raised the idea of writing a concerto. And I was like, 
great. Well, how do we make it happen? And so we just both kind of started making phone calls. You know, um, we we both have a number of connections in the music world. And, um, and so we kind of put out some feelers and those ended up being the orchestras that were interested in being a part of it. Um, and they were all, they're all kind of different, you know, I mean, Kalamazoo, um, the music director there, Julian Querty is an old pal of mine. Um, uh, MCO, I already talked about my connection here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, Sioux City, uh, their music director, Ryan Haskins, he's, he's a friend of Kati's and had, again, loved her music. So he was, he'd been looking for an opportunity. So, um, so it, it just kind of all fell into place that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the things I found really interesting is you would think, because uh, you're going to be con- conducting music tonight and tomorrow as well, you would think that you would program, you know, works that have significant works, wind parts, you know, as a horn player yourself. But instead, you've chosen the Respighi uh, Third Suite of Engineers and Dances and the Brahms Liebeslied Waltzes. What is it about conducting strings that you find so fascinating? I think one of the main things actually is that the the core of the mco is really the string players and um mm. and it's such a great group and so you know to me that's kind of that's kind of the bread and butter of the group so i mean not necessarily these precise pieces but the way that they they come together right um they have this great ability to be i think there are 18 string players on stage this week um but it, it really feels like a big chamber ensemble. And, you know, it's not a situation where there's a conductor just like standing up there beating time and telling everyone what to do. Like everyone's kind of has ideas and helps out with technical details. So it's, it's a really, it's a really wonderful string ensemble. So I just, you know, I kind of wanted to exploit that. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about the arrangements of the Brahms Liebeslieder waltzes? They're arrangement by Friedrich Hermann. Uh, the Liebeslieder waltzes were originally written for uh, piano four hands, and um, I once was sitting in a chamber music session, and uh, the teacher was a pianist, and he was talking about Brahms's piano music, and it's all about voicing and you know making sure that the right melodic line is voiced properly, but not only the melodic line, also the you know the the, the supporting voices in the hands of the pianist does the transcription that Friedrich Kerman do is it, does it, how does it work? Is it, is it, is it as, as effective? Well, to me, the key is actually the texts of the waltzes. So they are all based on um, folk melodies, uh, folk tunes, and right. the, the texts all deal with love uh, in one form or another. And so, you know, there's one, which is, metaphorically a little bird flitting around and then the bird gets caught in the, the, the twigs and branches. And then the, the bird escapes and is longing for the right hand to go and land on. And the bird decides to fly off again and be on its own. And, um, and then there's another one where, you know, the lyric is just, uh, Oh, die Frauen, you know, Oh, women, Oh, women, if it weren't for you, I'd already be a monk. Um, yeah. so, you know, the, the waltzes to, to look at the parts, to look at the score, it, it can kind of just look like, you know, one of those like blue Danube or something where you have just a series of waltzes and they, they can be a little un- undifferentiated, but once you, once you sort of see what the songs were that Brahms was setting, then it, it, it all kind of falls into place in terms of how to make the phrases work and the tempos and the gestures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to wrap the conversation up this way. Uh, Is the Boston Symphony Orchestra season done uh, for the year? And I guess uh, where I'm going with this is what's next? What's after, after Winnipeg, where are you off to next? Um, Yes. The, the winter season is done. So at the moment it's pop season back there. And as a principal player, I don't, I don't do pops. So, um, so I, you know, this is like a, a good time of year for me to do projects like this. Um, we do uh, basically the months of July and August, we're at Tanglewood, which is in right. Western Massachusetts. And that's our summer home. 
Yeah, I was wondering about um, that. Yeah. So we head out there um, at the beginning of July. Um, mm. I just heard actually. Uh, this is apropos of nothing, but I just saw a little thing. They're they're making a, a biopic about Leonard Bernstein, um, starring Bradley Cooper. Uh, as Bernstein. Yeah. yeah, I know it's kind of boggles the mind, doesn't it? But um, uh, but they're filming like right right at this moment as we speak. They're filming at Tanglewood because he had a he had a right, yes. big yeah, connection yeah. to it to it. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I I won't be seeing. <laughs> I probably won't see the ghost of Lenny while I'm out there. But um, yeah, yeah. So that's what's <laughs> that's what's next. Um, I have uh, I have a little bit of downtime, which is really you know, getting into prep time for the summer. Right, right, right. Uh, James, this has been a real pleasure to chat with you today. Uh, the concert tonight and tomorrow with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra sounds like it's going to be amazing. Uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Good to talk to you. Thank you.